Hey, Jay, you hear me now? Yep. Oh, now I can see you. Perfect. Okay, well, you know, Skype is just a, a terrible, terrible thing sometimes. It, it's, it, does it, uh, it's been really horrible lately. Either way. Okay, so let me just jump into something with you, because outside of Hollywood decodes that you are known for, you've also been talking a lot about some modern Brave New World parallels, which I think are all very, very apt. I, I, I dig into that book a lot on this show as well, because for all of the times that people reference 1984, Brave New World is so much more where we are. 1984 right. is a great guide to how the media works, but in the book... <laughs> Um, what is it in the book? Um, you know, failing to take the state mandated drugs are a crime, as you pointed out. Um, have you ever done a breakdown of Equilibrium, though, the Christian Bale movie? Um, it's on our list to do. So my wife and I were actually going through a series on all the dystopian films chronologically in terms of when the movies are set. So we just did uh, RoboCop and the island and a bunch of those terminator era and then now uh, i think equilibrium will be coming up in the near future so it's actually one we're going to get to but yeah you're absolutely right to li liken that to um brave new world because you know in, in the film christian bale's son if i recall is basically a child spy and he you know rats him out for not <laughs> taking his soma basically yeah and, and in that respect, uh, in that movie, as you'll see, and I, I can't wait to watch that breakdown, but it's the, you have to take your, your daily because it, it dulls out your emotions. And that mandate, it really reminded me of Rudolf Steiner. Um, I don't know if you ever looked into Rudolf Steiner. I haven't heard you talk about him. But he would in the early 20th century, he went on to talk about how drugs eventually, especially in the form of vaccines, would be used to dull out our spirit and kill our connection to the divine. And uh, it really shines through in that film because it has that kind of, um, that kind of Christ-like situation that comes in, the, 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 the use of color. You're gonna, it's all gonna mm -hmm. come and uh, slap you in the face, of course, but it's, um, it's really interesting there. Brave New World, though, I, I love when you do those breakdowns. Yeah, thanks, I remember uh, looking at Brave New World really in depth about five or six years ago. I, I put it in my book as a pretty significant analysis. And then more recently, I've been diving into Tavistock and MK Ultra. And um, if you if you look at the life of Huxley, he's kind of doing pre MK Ultra stuff in the UK. Uh, and I actually did a really deep dive recently on um, MK Ultra operations that a lot of people don't know about what all they were up to in Australia. So I've gone really deep into that. And uh, in terms of drugs, one of the things that I found out was that some of the figures who were doing uh, research that are pretty well-known figures now, some of whom have even gotten scientific awards, they were doing research off the coast of Australia in Papua New Guinea to uh, isolate prions. And so if you know about, you know, where we are now, prions are a big deal. And so that actually comes out of bio warfare research uh, and MK Ultra, believe it or not. Yeah, and I have I have been paying uh, very close attention to all of that. Um, th there has been quite a few medical professionals coming out that have talked about this, the certain injections that are going are being pushed right now and how they they make those prions, prions, those crystals and when what it can do, what it can lead us toward. But uh, I, I think aside from that, the statistics don't lie about how much prescription medication, especially uh, psychotropic drugs and things like that, that uh, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, uh, all of it, we gobble up most mm -hmm. the lion's share of the world's drugs in that respect. So um, to I, I would say to get people... To get people that are already so um, uh, already uh, marinating in in this kind of these substances, and then expose them to the kind of nonstop propaganda we have, as well as the base programming that happens in K through eight schooling, holy hell, man! Yeah, the uh, the whole system is really engineered to make us into uh, you know these sort of cogs in the machine and to root out individuality. In fact, some of the the Tavistock uh, studies and the MK Ultra studies were all about figuring out ways to rid the individual of individuality. Um, I was reading a um, psychiatrist uh, analysis of ritual abuse the other day, and he was noticing that a lot of the people who had undergone ritual abuse that he counseled 
he noticed that the one of the common patterns in the different cults was to break down individuality and turn them into essentially mind-controlled zombies of the cult. Now, typically that was satanic uh, type cults, but it could apply to other you know non-satanic cults too. But if we think about it, that's really what the state and society as a whole is doing, or at least the big pharma corporate state, is they want to turn everybody into uh, cult members, basically. And that's what we're seeing now. Everybody's in this kind of like a giant cult. And uh, the more that I look into the history of Tavistock, one of the key figures, for example, was Kurt Lewin. Um, and Kurt Lewin also was an MKUltra doctor. So people don't know that uh, Tavistock, you know, is directly connected to, MK it's basically the British version of MKUltra. And um, it, all of those studies in social engineering were all about engineering society as a whole. And a big part of that is, you know, the big pharmaceutical companies. And that's who really gave us, uh, you know, the, the, the synthesized forms of all these naturally occurring drugs. And they did all that on purpose. And when they sent their emissaries down to Latin and South America, like Gordon Wasson, to find these different uh, plants and shrooms and whatnot, it was for the purpose of synthesizing them to be a method of social control, and that's where we are today. Ta wait, that, that, that is as much as Tavistock was involved in, too? That's, that's where they were. Yes. I did not know that. Now, they, Tavistock was, was in the U.K. doing social engineering social research. Social engineering. And they okay. actually, their origins were... Uh, post-traumatic stress studies uh, or shell shock. So after World War I, the Tavistock Clinic is created, and then they get a gigantic grant from the Rockefeller Institute to uh, foundation to expand into this, quote, clinic, which studies dissociation, uh, depersonalization, it, everything uh, as, uh, to like managerial techniques in corporate settings. So they become this master class type of thing in social engineering. And some of the, the doctors, not everybody, but some of the doctors from uh, Tavistock were MKUltra doctors, like like uh, Kurt Lewin. Yeah, you see, this this is all this is the kind of stuff that I love getting the uh, the background on because a lot of them are 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 entities that that come up in conversation. Sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose, as we we say. The um, mm -hmm. the internet, of course, being the greatest modern tool there is for all kinds of social engineering and these sociological experiments that are going on but as you were as you are so um keen on on laying out there the generations before this connectivity of the internet that we have we had things like the frankfurt school coming out of weimar germany and critical theory that we are now uh, there's all little uh, mutations of critical theory that we are obviously uh, you know, fighting over right now over here in the 21st century in the U.S. and and elsewhere. There's Club of Rome. There's the CFR. Yep. I mean, but but one entity that usually slips well below people's radar is the Tavistock Institute. And I uh, and I, I I caught that great segment that you did not too long oh. ago. And uh, so it's good that yeah, give us a little bit more about the origins there and the contributions to the current predicament. Maybe we can trace that a little bit better. Sure. So Tavistock begins, as we said, after World War One. They started noticing that soldiers uh, would would have these flashback. You know, everybody thinks about the crazy Vietnam vet walking around their town and don't make a, a sound too loud or you know, set off a firework next to the vet because he'll flip out and go into his <laughs> go into psycho mode. Well, that's because of the idea of shell shock. And when they noticed this after World War One, they said we need to study this. And then it became a situation where it was, you know, verging into research into multiple personalities, disassociative, disassoci disassociative states, fugue states, et cetera. And uh, the, the, that's when they got a grant from Rockefeller Institute, uh, as I said. And it included some pretty famous names uh, connected to uh, Tavistock originally, even people like Carl Jung. They wanted to implement, you know, it wasn't Bernays, different. wasn't Bernays uh, a part of that? Edward, uh, Edward Bernays. I believe so, yeah, I believe he did have a connection. Pretty much anybody who was well known in that early phase of, um, you know, psychology and, and uh, uh, even the advertising world, exactly like Bernays, they, they had connections to Tavistock because there's a big overlap between social engineering and uh, psychological warfare operations because a lot of the people who went into that you know were uh, guys who had studied wartime intelligence stuff and then they would either go into advertising or uh, consulting firms PR firms Lipmon or ad admin so if you think about Mad Men um, the Don Draper character is actually kind of a model of the guy who goes out of who is 
wartime he's a soldier guy and then he moves into being this uh this ad man and he and, and the, the point there is just that they were taking all these techniques of uh what's called weltanschauungskrieg or worldview warfare and they're applying it to advertising and the way it relates to social engineering is that well just if you think about it you're trying to convince people to adopt your ideology so the same principles behind selling stuff right which involves shutting off critical thinking and getting people to just sort of react with their base desires that's totally useful right for both uh, advertising and for uh, social engineering so Again, all these figures who uh, played early uh, key roles like Bernays, uh, even Kurt Lewin, he also has a connection between Frankfurt School and uh, Tavistock as well as MKUltra. A lot of these figures uh, uh, I've turned up, you know, end up being really important figures in MKUltra too. So uh, so Tavistock has this wartime role of, of basically doing, as we said, research into uh, psychical states in terms of mental states i'm saying and then it sort of transitions into um corporations sort of hiring them to tell them how to best run their corporations and so tavistock actually came up with the idea of soft fascism or democratic fascism and so they figured out ways that they could get people in a corporate setting to totally adopt groupthink oh uh, tavistock pioneered the idea of groupthink to get individuals to shut off uh, individual thinking, right, to submit to the group. And they even figured out the best ways and motivators to get people to do that. Um, so they, for example, the idea of little little tiny pins and, 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 and awards or employee of the month, that's a, that's a Tavistock thing that would get people to fight, you know, each other for some pittance, you know, oh, this week you get, you know, like 10 more points on your Kroger credit card or whatever. but. And, and really, it's just uh, a way to control people and adopt group things. So those are some key examples of how that stuff is now used, not just in a corporate setting, but now socially, right? The social credit system is really the macrocosm version of that very, uh, you know, employee of the month type uh, model. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I, I was I, my next question was going to be what was going to be about modernizing this kind of stuff. How how did the modernization of these these you know old world think tanks really go and we and then uh, as you're speaking abs absolutely the 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 group think that's going on in the corporate world is insane i get i get uh emails and text messages from friends of mine who are trying to survive their best in corporate america that are bombarded they're not even doing their they're barely doing work at at times because they're getting bombarded with with group uh you know identity uh, uh bonding sessions and 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 guilt and atonement uh, uh shit it's it's ridiculous and then of course there's um there's this whole idea that you just brought up there with with uh what was that last point you just said outside of the the group think there was well, that the, they would they could apply those strategies to all society oh, with social credit. The social credit. I mean, yeah, are, so, are we so not group think in in small settings can be applied on the you know the collective global setting, and that's why Tavistock has been instrumental in promoting not just things like feminism, but also uh, if you are familiar with the white paper, changing images of man. That's a Stanford research connected thing, but it's connected. Stanford was research was connected to uh, Tavistock study. So a lot of what Stanford research puts out is very similar to and connected with the research that uh, Tavistock has been putting out. And you see that now because in the last five years, uh, what Tavistock is most uh, publicly known for is uh, I'm trying to think of the right code words for our uh, social media settings that we have here um, for uh, changing changing your what you identify as uh, you catch my drift yes um tavistock has been instrumental in figuring out the ways to convince people to do those things you know i there was another there's a long time rumor that tavistock was behind um a lot of different types of uh, websites too like fringe message boards that i even like to frequent from time to time godlike productions and and uh, other places, it, it, it you know, it comes and goes, and people said there was used to be little footers where it said Tavistock Institute or whatever, um, and that made sense. The the little that I knew about about the institute, that's why I wanted to get a lot more background tonight. But it would make sense that 
the internet, which of course is a military defense project in itself, which we are now a planet of 7 billion people, a huge portion of that planet is now voluntarily spilling every thought that they have, everything that they do, every desire, every commercial inclination. I mean, it is the, to, to call it a social experiment is, mm-hmm. is, uh, is a, the understatement of, of, you know, our species history, but. Well, another thing that you kind of uh, alluded to earlier that Tavis thought was connected to is the idea of uh, selling people on guilt for uh, environmental issues. Uh, they were big with, you know, Club of Rome type stuff of, of getting people to believe that, you know, humans are the problem. If we just have less people, if we have less uh, stuff, if you don't, if you don't have private property, which we see World Economic Forum now, you know, promoting, Klaus is out there saying, "You will own nothing, you will have nothing, you will be happy." You're right. you, you'll basically be a slave of the global elite, and it's Tavistock's job is to sell the idea, right? Oh, you know, we uh, the, the reason that we have. Uh, natural disasters is because we are, you know, throwing away trash and because we have babies, this kind of crap. Tavistock back in the 70s was coming out with ways to promote that as well as uh, ideas like veganism. Tavistock was connected with uh, SRI in, in coming up with white papers to sell veganism back in the late 70s. Literally, they were already figuring out how can we tie veganism and, oh, man is hurting the planet, man kills the animals. And then down the road, we see this stuff rolling out, right? Last year was hailed as the year of the vegan when we saw the uh, Economist magazine, Jay-Z and Beyonce, oh, coming out, oh, we're all vegan, everybody's vegan now. All of that is merely uh, one angle of changing images of man, to get man to see himself as the problem, to see a different, uh, a totally reoriented view of nature and of man and his place in the world. And now the idea is austerity, we got to kill everybody off. We got to have great reset. We got to have year zero. We got to start over. We got to have no more consumption. We got too much, too many consumers. Now it's got to be, you know, it's the, it's the same idea as the austerity that the banking elite have been selling for the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. And, you know, in the second half of tonight's show, I wanted to jump into some of the, the notes I had compiled uh, early last year on Mind War, because I know that you have spent a lot of time on that yes. and uh, Lieutenant right. Colonel Michael Aquino and all that stuff. But, you know, as you were just speaking right there, man as being the problem. That right there is the Mind War uh, working right there where, where you are, are putting out this this image through mass media that they control um, in, in such a big, big time way that that the the victors ha- are, have already been victorious, that the problem will be extinguished and there's no uh, use in fighting, fighting it. But also, a- as you were talking a little bit about um, about how it was the year of the vegan, well, we've already been told, wow, uh, you know, for everybody being inside for nine to ten months, we were able to see the horizon a little bit more. Mountain ranges were not were not fogged out by the haze of pollution exactly. of people out there. The shutdowns. Now they're going to call for climate lockdowns. Climate lockdowns. Uh, we had a couple of weeks there before every, they started throwing Bill Gates under the bus with all of the divorce stuff. We got fungus burgers. No, obviously they're trying to tell everybody do not have children. Burgers. Don't have children because the the the, the environment can't take it. So. Uh, the, the the mental gymnastics and the mental burdens that have been given to people have been mm-hmm. uh, and of course of course they they hyper focus it on white European uh, people and then they they go and they jump up and down and they say hey guess what white people for the first time have not had their population grow in God knows how long why could this be happening you're convincing us to kill ourselves off and and, and eat eat crickets. Instead of instead of me, it's holy hell, man! It's a it's a multi layered yeah, cake. You said that I just saw that uh, Washington Post article in a stack of old articles, literally about an hour ago, and I, I bumped across that, uh, ran across the about the declining populations of uh, of whites in the West, and so that's part of that guilt manipulation that, that you're bad merely for existing. It's almost like they have a uh, an inverted version of, of the doctrine of original sin, right, from Christianity, where they take it. Now the, the original sin is that you're a carbon sinner, right? Like you sin by breathing air and oxygen and this kind of stuff, and you're bad from Mother Earth. But 
the irony is that, as you know, uh, you know, going through a lot of these writings of the global elite, they even admit that that's all made up, right? I mean, the, the first uh, global revolution by Club of Rome many, many years ago said, let's just, we're going to invent a thing, and we invented pollution that man is the pollutant, man is the problem. And they even say in the document, it's invented, it's made up. Clear as day, right, in the paragraph, it says that we have we have come to use this invention uh, of man being a pollutant. But really, it's ultimately, as you know, uh, Frank, it's an occultic idea, too, that if they can reinstitute a kind of a sacrifice and get men, humans to basically sacrifice themselves, to sterilize themselves, then uh, they think that it will sort of Foist the next phase of uh, evolution upon us. So they think that they can be the kind of uh, lab coat uh, priest that will steer evolution into the next phase. And you see this in Bertrand Russell, you see it in Jonas Salk's writings, you see it in um, H.G. Wells. They literally think that they can take on the reins of evolution and steer it to where they will move into the next phase and everybody else will die off. And I mean, it's just here we are, uh, people cannot believe it and it's what we've been talking about for so long is literally rolling out in front of everybody's eyes but everybody's just gaslit and they can't believe it the gaslighting and i think that's that's also what protects them karmically you, we talk about everything from a an occult standpoint uh especially when you break it down and stuff there too one of the the telltale old as uh old as sin kind of rules there is that that need to be i don't know be very subtle in your deceit. You gotta so when when you have somebody like the or some group like the Club of Rome that in the in the late 1970s puts that out there. Hey, listen, this we were coming up with what could be the next big thing, and who mm -hmm. could be the who could be the target, the antagonist of this new plot. And this is what we decided. It's public. It's available for anybody to see. If you don't if you don't acknowledge it, whose fault is that? You've you've pretty much invited the vampire into your house. But more people are well, and not as many as they think, because then 2020 wouldn't have happened. But more people are are taken uh, they're taken aback by the the majesty of someone like Greta Thunberg, who comes sailing across the ocean. Like, oh wow, yes, yes, yes. Get take my tax money, 16 year old. So uh, and, how dare you? I should be in school. How dare? Yeah, Greta, Greta is a, a human shield, right? So she's like a tool of propaganda. They love to use kids because you can't attack a kid, right? Oh, how mean! You're so mean. But she's an, obviously a propaganda creation, right? I mean, she, it's, it's so absurd that anybody with an IQ over you know 80 ought to be able to figure it out. And they know that, right? They, they've always the, you, kids are great uh, tools for wartime propaganda, right? You show a child who's been supposedly killed or dusty from the situation and warfare or whatever it's 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 classic uh, propaganda and when you know that you can recognize it very easily but yeah really this is just about medical tyranny um i won't go too deep into that but uh you know one of the global elite writers that i did cover was Fritov capra and he wrote in his famous book uh turning turning point i think back in uh like the early 80s, he said that medicine would be the key uh, sort of backdoor angle that the new that the new global elite order could use to uh, basically bring in their plans, right? Because most people just default to their medical expert, especially boomers. Boomers say, oh, I believe whatever my doctor tells me. They could have a doctor who's 500 pounds, you know, totally unhealthy, and they'll listen to this guy for health advice, right? <laughs> like, so they're, they'll listen to their doctor. And I mean, the doctor tells them to eat the, you know, Jimmy Carter food pyramid, right? Which is like 12 servings of grains a day. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? It's like two cups of sugar a day minimum. Just total, just absurdity, right? Just things that on a on the face of it in terms of nutrition make no sense. But these experts, right? These are the health experts. So they conditioned a whole generation of, you know, boomers and their their parents to just defer to experts. So get away from critical thinking, get away from you making your own decisions, doing your own research. Just defer to experts. Quigley talks about that. He said that in the next uh, phase of the business plan, the global uh, order, they would bring in an, a reign of experts to where you would be conditioned to be a bad person if you even question experts. That's by design. And he said back in the 60s that they would have an order in place where you do not question the experts. Right. So it's a new dogma, which is so odd. Right? I thought we were in the world of, you know, free thought and, you know, libertarian and we were free from the ancient medieval dogmas. No, no, no. It's a new dogma. 
It's a technocratic dogma. You don't question the holy inquisition of the robotic technocrats. Oh, no, no, not at all. And and I, I've done breakdowns on that before, you know, just from uh, just from what I know about growing up uh, Catholic. And I know that you have a you, you have a, such an affinity for the Catholic church but 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 just well, i don't have a problem with catholics but i don't like the papacy as an institution well uh, either way just just taking what i know about the structure of, of of everything there to see how they have created as you said a religion they have they have holy days uh they have uh, i mean all, all their award shows are pretty much like a, a religious holidays yeah. they've got mantras they've got uh they've got martyrs they've got saints They've got devils. They have everything you need. Prayers. They, they everything. Every and now they've got a Eucharist with all these shots. It's really yeah. it, it's it's really something incredible. But you know, I want to move on to some uh, something else before we uh, get to the last thing I wanted to ask you. This has been such a great conversation. And since we're talking about these psychological warfare programs um, and how far back they go, we know that during the Vietnam War there was a lot of work being uh, being done on these programs with Afghanistan now being so close in comparison with Vietnam from the shady beginnings to obvious mm. drug trade incentives mm -hmm. to prolonging yeah. the engagement through these paralyzing rules of engagement. N and now we have this anticlimactic, somewhat embarrassing end to it all. It's very, it, it's incredible how they match up. You could put a stencil over it. How is Afghanistan's situation reading for you? I know it, that might be a, the, too broad of a question, but uh, you can get as specific as you'd like. Yeah, well, so I don't know the whole picture. Obviously, I've been, uh, you know, listening to a lot of people's analyses over the past couple of days. And my take would be, you know, if we remember the history that, you know, it's the gate to Eurasia. So it's a um, place where empires have always wanted to control that region, not just for their resources and the drug resources that exist there in terms of opium, sure, but uh, also for its strategic location as the gateway to Eurasia and controlling the Eurasian heartland in terms of uh, you know, geopolitical geopol power structures has always been the key. You have to control that. Brzezinski said, we got, you know, to control the world, you have to control Eurasia, thus the importance of uh, Afghanistan. And of course, Brzezinski was instrumental in setting up the Mujahideen as the base, as the freedom fighters for the CIA during that, uh, you know, latter period of the Cold War fighting the, the Soviets. So uh, they have that role as a sort of tool of the global elite, uh, you could say back then, I would tend to think that they still have to probably to some degree that role as tool. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that uh, because what they what they did in Afghanistan, that they're because they basically threw out, you know, Americans or whatever that, oh, uh, now that shows that we lost. Uh, it's not a, a battle between Afghanistan and America. It's a bigger po uh, a power structure that at least probably since Vietnam and maybe even earlier, the wars aren't meant to be won. If you if you remember in 1984, this comes up when O'Brien's talking to Winston and he says, Winston, the wars aren't meant to be won or lost. They're meant to go on. And so I see, uh, at least since Vietnam, and uh, my publisher has a really good take, I think, on Vietnam. His dad was in the OSS and knew all about, you know, the, the drug lanes and all that. And, and he said that, you know, Vietnam was not meant to be one. It was really a war that was a psychological operation against the West and against America. So wars can function for many different purposes and many different reasons. And so uh, I think the normie take is like, who won, who lost? Like it's a U uh, UFC match or something like that. No. Wars have a much uh, greater purpose in terms of military industrial complex, making money, uh, resources, strategic control, um, and also the psychological use of and test lab usage of warfare, especially Vietnam. A lot of DARPA technology was actually tested at Vietnam. It was a big, it was a big experiment, basically. Um, and so what Vietnam did was basically make America look bad. It was a big, huge. Uh, problem and a psychological attack on Americans and seeing, you know, how many people law, uh, died and, 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 you know, for no reason it didn't accomplish anything. It was really a morale destroyer. Uh, and I think that probably if we were to liken it to something like Vietnam, it's the same type of thing where it's just continual chaos. The wars aren't meant to be won that they're, they're meant to continue 
for the purpose of constant uh, destruction, rebuilding, destruction, rebuilding, destruction, rebuilding. And um, it's a it, it, it entirely could be, you know, handing the, the region over to China, too. It could be something like that as well. All of those things are possibilities. But I don't think that uh, it's like some victory, you know, against America. It's, it's intended to make America look bad. I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I really am. I, I was, you know, the last couple of days on this show, we've been just picking through it, taking calls and seeing what everybody's thinking. And as you were talking about with the, 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 the normie, the very normie take on this is who won and who lost. Uh, another another kind of fractal element of that very normie kind of argument is which president is to blame. Yeah, for exactly. for one thing or another. Right. Now there there are there are marginal things you can say could have been done better, and maybe one person could have left the uh, left the region with a, a little bit more of a smooth kind of a um, you know swagger than the other. But eventually, uh, what would have been lasting, and what were we doing for the t- the twenty years that we were there? It's. Um, it's not it's it, it's very it's very disconcerting to see everything being uh hashed out in such a shallow way because it's obvious here we've seen a business model that has now played out in multiple major engagements over the last few generations Absolutely. and and you think that pattern recognition would get easier for people and i really do believe it is uh, you want to you want to end on a on a on a high note what what makes you hopeful about where we are right now and uh and how people are perceiving reality i think a lot of people are noticing all the contradictions and the mistakes and the absurdities and the irrationality and they're waking up but it's a question of is it enough and you know what do we do so um, hopefully we have enough resistance to all the madness to, you know, say no to all this stuff that they're trying to foist upon us. And ultimately, you know, I think I do have a religious perspective. So I think that in the end, uh, the good, good guys win, so to speak. So uh, that's how I would win on a happy note is that I'm not too worried about the day to day news cycle. The day to day news cycle itself is kind of a, uh, a psyop, so, so to yeah. speak, to get you, you know, constantly agitated and upset. Not saying I don't follow the news, but I'm not super concerned about the the news cycle because it really is constructed as a kind of a destabilizing, you know, <laughs> psyop. Also, so um, I'm not too worried about that stuff. Uh, and even if things get worse, I think that it they'll get better all the all the sooner. Well, Jay, it's always awesome to have you on. It really is. Uh, your your name and, of course, your website has been on the lower third the whole time. Jay'sAnalysis.com. Tell everybody what your broadcast schedule is like, where they can find you, where they can get your books. Go ahead. Thanks, dude. Yeah, no, it's uh, always great talking to you, Frank. And uh, I, I really need you to come on, too. We, we've talked for a year about, you know, you, you coming on my channel doing a, a chat, too. So. We'll do Hopefully it. we can we can set that up pretty soon. But you can find me at jasonalsis.com. Uh, I've got a vast archive of five years of interviews and lectures, and then you can go to uh, my YouTube channel, obviously Jay Dyer. And then uh, I've been doing a lot of content on a new uh, free speech based platform called Rockfin. That's pretty pretty good. Frank, you might want to check that out if you haven't heard about Rockfin. I think Chrissy Mayer just came over to Rockfin too. Cool. So. All right. Um, they're really good company. I'm really really happy with them. And then I host, as we said. Uh, you know whose show a, a J O N E S uh, <laughs> usually usually on the on Thursdays uh, two to three so uh, you can find my books at the website and uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that as well just under my name tremendous tremendous thanks again Jay it's been uh, been awesome to have you on awesome dude thank you all right ladies and gentlemen we will be right back we have a we have a little bit of an intermission now then when we come back we're going deeper. We're going to just go, we, we already set up ourselves nicely, then we're going to go just a little bit deeper, and it's based